Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Linda, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. Hi. And I'm Scott, alcoholic. And uh, I want to I want to thank Tim and Frida and everyone else on the committee who who worked so hard to make this happen, and especially the New Hope Fellowship Group for sponsoring it. Uh, thank you. Well, isn't that an amazing thing for an alcoholic to get invited back anywhere? <laughs> but but more than once. Mm-hmm. I mean, truly, truly, mm-hmm. it's it's a wonderful thing for us. I, I want you to know that. Uh, Linda and I do not consider ourselves to be experts on anything you're going to hear us do this weekend. We're going to share our experience from various pieces of conference-approved literature from both conferences, and uh, we're going to share things that we have learned that have worked for us. I am on a constant search for people to disagree with me. I'm not an arguer any- anymore, but that's how I learn. So if I have something to say this weekend that you disagree with, you could do me a personal favor by letting me know about that at one of the breaks. Okay. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No. Oh. Yeah, you get a pass on that. And um, but but truly, I get a chance to learn things that way. So please, if you disagree with something I've got to say, it, it may be a chance for me to learn something, and I will approach it that way if you bring it to me that way. Uh, but we are not experts, and I'm, I say I'm constantly looking for someone to disagree. The um, this evening, and I, I know you've had you've got an overview of the weekend, but this evening we're going to talk. Lynn and I are going to talk about our own personal experiences of applying the traditions in relationships, not specifically the boy-girl relationship, but relationships in general. There will be a pretty good bit of boy-girl in it, but relationships in general can be helped by the traditions. And one of my teachers says that the traditions are a set of principles that are designed to protect AA from my very best motives. And it was one of my great lessons that this thing is not about motive, this thing that we do. It's about principle because I get in big trouble with good motive, and I have on a number of occasions. So it's about principle, and that's what we're going to try to talk about is the principles that underlie and how we're applying them and how they're working for us. And uh, we don't claim, claim to be perfect about this. The, uh, the format is going to be, uh, Linda's going to read the odd Elanon traditions. Uh, that would be the odd numbered, I'm sorry, odd, odd numbered. I know it. Uh, and uh, and she'll she'll read number one and talk about it, and then I'll talk about one and read two. And so we'll be alternating in the literature. And uh, and I think that's it. A, a relationship, by the way, we believe is a framework for growth. And that's what it is. And I resisted growth all my life because I resist change. If you think about it, what is growth? It's change in a positive direction. Sure. So one of the things I've had to learn is to change my thinking to change my actions first and then allow that to change my thinking. And I'll want to turn it over to my wife. Again, my name's Linda, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. And um, I have learned from Al-Anon to ask for what I need. And so we have traveled today, and it's been kind of discombobulated, and, and I'd like for all of us to kind of be on the same page. And so that moment of silence before the serenity prayer Someone once asked Lois Wilson what she did in that moment of silence, and she said, I invite God to the meeting. So if we could just have another moment of silence, you can use it however you want. I've already um, done some prayer. I'm prayed up, but, but right now, and there's not a cover on this, so I know you can see my feet, and that always makes me more nervous, so... Uh, if we could have a moment of silence for me to kind of all get here, and if you'd be willing to ask the God of your understanding, come join us. Thank you. So that does mean that I'm not up here by myself. I've got the incredible loving God of my understanding. And um, actually, the things that I'm going to share with you are things that have been passed on to me. And if we quote anybody, any of our sponsees, or if we tell a story that we've heard at another meeting, we have to let you know up front, this is like a disclaimer. We have permission from those people. So it's not like we're trying to gossip or talk about them outside a meeting. And we've Certainly, I want to put in my thanks to everybody that's had a part of this weekend, and I want to thank you for coming here, letting your feet guide you to put you someplace so that you can have an an experience in recovery this weekend. And this is going to be our weekend. We've got this gorgeous space. I encourage you to make your nest where you are. You know, get comfortable, take your shoes off, whatever. 
All weekend long, we're going to have this little ask it basket, and it doesn't even have to have a question. Like if you have a, a curiosity about something relating to program, um, please write it down, and we'll have a chance to share some of that. Like Scott said, we don't consider ourselves an expert, but I think if we do a group conscience of all of us, we'll be able to uh, talk about some of the, some of our concerns. I also um, encourage you to pick up a little safety pin. In my home group, when someone is going to go do something that they're nervous about, like do a workshop or I always say go visit parents, you know, those the scary things that we have to do, um, that we, we, my group has actually held these safety pins and put um, hello and greetings and blessings. And it's just kind of a low-budget guardian angel. So I welcome you to come by and get a, um, a safety pin. I also have some pictures of our family members because this is about relationships. We are gone a lot on the weekends. In fact, um, this, we're going to have a new edition of these pictures. Our daughter is... Um, she went to the doctor today, and we may get a phone call this weekend about our wonderful new baby, Samantha, deciding to ring the doorbell sooner than Monday. So we've packed extra clothes in case we just leave here and go straight to Atlanta. And, and, and what a rejoicing. You know, when I introduce myself as Al-Anon, and I'm so glad to see AA and Al-Anon participating in something, uh, we travel across the country, and that does not always happen. And I was just so pleased to come in and see some of the Al-Anon literature. And I want to tell you that I'm just Al-Anon. I did a lot of bonding drinking. You know, I tried to qualify. It looked like y'all were having a whole lot more fun down at the other end of the hallway because we're, we're so worried all the time. And, uh, but, but I'm just an Al-Anon and, uh, I've been in Al-Anon since, uh, before, uh, since about 1987. And my growth has come through relationships and, and going to meetings. Um, and I want to say a little bit about Al-Anon. I, I loved hearing our, uh, the opening, you know, good to have our welcome on that. But Al-Anon has but one purpose and that's to help families of alcoholics. And the only requirement for membership is that you have a friend or family member that has a problem with drinking. So in truth, um, everybody that sits in an AA meeting probably qualifies for Al-Anon, but that was just a little commercial. I was just a little side commercial. But I was so pleased to see that they have an Al-Anon directory here in case you want to know where an Al-Anon meeting is. I just thought that was wonderful. And it also, we have a little pop quiz that says, are you troubled by somebody else's drinking? I have seen many, many times an AA member really get the first step as far as their drinking's concerned, but then they'll come and ask me, but why can't my sister stop drinking? Uh, well, we're powerless over alcohol. But anyway, and then the says, did you grow up with a, with a problem drinker? So if you get your hands on some of the Al-Anon literature, maybe you'll find out we're not always the first flower to bloom in the garden, okay? So we're going to we're gonna be here this weekend. It's a workshop. That's why we're a little more casual. You're not going to hear our story. Also, a workshop means, um, actually, I think that's misnamed. We're going to try to make this more a play shop. And uh, you're not going to be, we're not going to be the talking heads all weekend. And uh, we're also very conscious of being able to take breaks. And that's for the, you know, the, the facilities and also for the there's the other reason that people need to go outside and, and take a break. I don't want to mention it because that may make them want to go have to take a break, right? I'm, I'm trying. As good as I, I know you know. are. I know you are. You really are. Okay. So I think that that's all of my, um, of my lead in. Uh, and like Scott said, that we're going to talk about relationships. And it may sound like we're talking about boy-girl, but in truth, um, haven't you come through this door tonight and, and greeted somebody and that was a, a relationship for, for that length of time? When you pull up at a red light, in truth, aren't you having some type of relationship with the people in the next car? In fact, I have a friend who says that her purpose in life is to stomp out global whining. So she, so she keeps a clown nose, one of those round, uh, red clown noses in her car. And she says, you know, she'll be in traffic and she'll look around and everybody's on their cell phone and blah, 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 you know. And she'll put that clown nose on and just sit there. And pretty soon, you know, everybody's laughing. And so, so, um, my wonderful father-in-law that I did not have a chance to meet, but I think I know him through his words of wisdom that Scott's told me that he said, 
He said that humans are herd animals. That means we're like cows, you know, <laughs> that we enjoy bumping up against each other. Um, you know, you've seen a horse in a, in a field use another horse's tail to keep the flies out of his face. I mean, we are, we, we're community. We like community. We like families. We like meetings. We like coming together. So everything is about relationships and truth. And um, I have not had a good success as far as romantic relationships. Um, Scott is, I, I introduced Scott as my now and forever husband. He's also my third husband. I had some fixer-uppers a couple of times. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and so I think that I've learned a, a, a lot about relationships because, you know, I'm somebody that walks around on the earth. I'm a daughter. I'm a mother. I, I'm an only child, so I don't have any siblings. I'm, I've got a resentment about that. But um, if you met my parents, you might... Well, anyway, we won't go there. Uh, um, we're just we're just in relationships all the time. So um, when Scott and I got together, we when we started dating and um, and and it's and we met in an open AA room. And when we started dating, um, we started trying to have some understandings, not rules, but just understandings. And I think that's what our traditions are, understandings. If You know, like if you're going to a, a football game, they've got certain rules of discipline that they do so they can all participate in the same game. It'd be kind of funny if one team was playing by football rules and the other team was playing by baseball rules. Maybe that's a new Olympic sport. I don't know. That might be kind of interesting. But anyway, so the traditions are just a way of our being able to stay in, in the same playing field with relationships. So when Scott and I got together, I, we started talking about how to have some understandings. And uh, because, quite honestly, Scott is my third husband, and when I heard the word relationship, relationship, I thought of the Titanic. I thought, this is going to sink, <laughs> and it's going to be very destructive. And it's, you know, or I, he I hear the music of Jaws playing every time I get close to a relationship. I... Um, <laughs> I never had relationship. I took hostages or I velcroed or I tried to, uh, you know, be the, the, the band director or whatever. So what we're going to talk about today may sound like boy-girl, but in truth, it's just think about all the relationships you have as you go through the day. So we're going to do the 12 steps as a base. And it says here in the Al-Anon literature, it says, no, the 12 traditions, it says, the 12 traditions these guidelines are a means of promoting harmony and growth in Al-Anon groups and in the worldwide fellowship of Al-Anon as a whole. Our group experience suggests that our unity depends upon our adherence to these traditions. And the odd one, number one, says, Our common welfare should come first. Personal progress for the greatest number depends upon unity. I think what this common welfare means, I think that is that we have to have a shared vision. I think that for this event to have happened this weekend, somebody must have had the thought, maybe Tim, because he, he knew us, and, and he said, I think this would be a nice, and then he, then he talked to somebody else, and so they begin to have a shared vision, and, and we're living in that, in that vision right now. We're sitting right here in it. It came to pass. So I think that common welfare is like a shared vision. And in Scott and I's relationship, it is like a railroad track. It's like we are independent rails. I'm over here on one side, and he's over here on the other side, and we're parallel to each other. We have parallel lives. But if you've ever, I grew up in West Texas, which was very flat, and if you've ever stood on a very flat railroad track, it looks like that those two rails eventually touch, but it's an optical illusion. Because if you move on down the railroad track, it actually, that, shared vision, that optical illusion, moves on down there also. So we're separate railroad tracks. We have a shared vision. And then the ties are what keep us connected together. Okay? And I think that's what has to be with all relationships. We cannot be one body with two heads on it. You know, I used to always somebody say, well, well, how are you doing? And I'd say, well, we're doing just fine. Because if he was doing just fine, we were doing just fine. So my disease is one of pronouns. I have to be very careful. I have to say my truth. I have to make I statements. I have to say about myself. And I, and I learned that by uh, hanging out in Al-Anon. 
And the other word that's important in this tradition to me is the word unity. Just like I talked about um, a relationship was like the Titanic, it was going to sink. Well, Scott and I like to fish, and we like to wade the creeks, and we like to fish the lakes. But one of our favorite things to do is we like to get in a canoe. And if you've ever been in a canoe with another person, you have to know, you have to have understandings, okay? Most of the time, a canoe is going to go in the same direction. Both of you are going to be going in the same direction. And you have to give each other information. You have to have unity. You have to say, I'm going to stand up now, because if you don't, then chances are the other person's going to try to counter-maneuver, and you're going to end up with all your lunch and your fishing gear in the bottom of the river. So I say that relationships should not be relationships. They should be relation canoes because you have to inform each other when you're about to do something. You have to go in the same direction. Uh, you have to um, paddle in, um, in, in synchronized, helpful ways. And so I think that I like the word unity as in a relation canoe, who, no matter who it's with. Thanks, Linda. Mm-hmm. I, I love the word harmony. Harmony is two or more people singing different notes that go well together. That's what harmony is. And I think that's in large measure what a relationship's about. It's not becoming the same people. Uh, I think this whole workshop this evening will be about unity. That's what it's about. How we do that, uh, we get up and go to bed at the same time. That's part of what we do. We, uh, I don't take sponsor phone calls after uh, 9 o'clock at night. Actually, I don't take them after 8. And I can be reached during the day. That's my family's time. I don't take them before 8 o'clock in the morning. I take emergencies. But don't call me at 11 o'clock at night to tell me you're doing fine. I don't need to hear it then. That's not fair. My family deserves time, and that's important. Um, I believe, uh, and I, this Linda's my second wife, and we both have children from previous, and I believe that the term blended family was coined by someone who was not in one. <laughs> uh, Linda also came up with something uh, that we call a couple up day. Wednesday afternoon, starting at 3.30, we drop off the planet. And uh, we have what a friend of mine calls a real live dangerous date. And uh, s- sometimes we go to a movie, sometimes we go to the boat, or we go fish, or we do. It's not go visit parents, it's not grocery shop time, but it's to go commit time. If I want to develop a relationship with anybody, I spend time with them, and I don't do all the talking. And we'll talk about that when we start talking about our relationships with God. That's part of what meditation's about. It's about not doing all the talking. I think that's important. I believe this too, and I heard this in a meeting in Chicago. I guess it's been 17 years ago now. Yeah, I, I just got my 22-year chip a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and thank you, and I mean thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, I was at the Mustard Seed Club in Chicago back when it was on Wells, and uh, I heard this girl say, my priority is not what I say it is. My priority is what I do. If I want to know what my priorities are, I don't listen to my words about the future. I look at my actions in the recent past. What was accomplished was a priority. What was not accomplished was not a priority. And anything I say to the contrary is a lie that I'm telling me. And I hated that when I heard it because I was lying to myself about all kinds of things that I said were priorities and I weren't, wasn't doing anything about them. So when I, to find out what my priorities are, I must stop and see what, what took my time today. And that, that's um, get into step 11 kind of quickly on that. But the evening half of step 11 is about me literally exploring my priorities. Uh, was the relationship with Linda a priority today? Was my recovery a priority today? Really? What did you do about it today? Was my uh, spiritual growth a priority today? Really? What did you do about it today? Those are pretty good questions. And that's how I find out. That's what that's what priority is about for me. Uh, I'm going to read Tradition 2 out of the uh, short form of uh, AA. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience, our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. And we talk about um, a trusted, loving God. Linda and I had a ceremony where we offered our relationship to God. We, we're, we're married. But prior to that, we had a, a, a ceremony where we offered God our relationship. We also offered him our home, our cars, everything else that we had, uh, our time and uh, and our money. And he's been taking it recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I want to tell you a story. I had a, a wonderful experience 
number of years ago, a young man walked into my home group, and he'd just come from his grandfather's funeral. And he said something struck him at that funeral, and he went to his grandmother, and he said to her, I think you were a fabulous wife for my grandfather. And she said, I should have been. I prayed to be that every day. And that hit me hard. And without saying anything to anyone, I began the next morning, and I don't think I've missed a morning since, and that's been five or eight years ago, maybe ten, that I prayed each morning to have God help me treasure Linda today. And, and we know the word treasure mostly is a noun. We understand it as a verb, but most frequently we hear it as a noun. And the point I'm making is within two weeks, I, I happened to walk through the den. Linda was on the phone talking to someone, and I overheard her say, Scott treasures me. Isn't that unusual? I believe that when I ask God for what he wants me to have, I get a lot of help. It's about me getting to the right question. And in my experience, that was one of them, that I can pray to treasure the people around me. And it's very, very important. Uh, some of you, someone teased me about my ugly watch earlier. I have this terrible, I think it's a terrible looking watch, but it's got four alarms on it. And that's important to me because in the morning, I've got two of them set. Um, I think they were set about 10 minutes this morning. It's what we normally do, somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on what the day looks like. The second alarm is the get-up time. When the first alarm goes off, Linda and I cuddle, and we do our morning prayers in each other's arms. If you can find a better way to start your day, call me, collect. I want to hear it. Now, I will grant you that there are mornings when the second alarm awakens one or both of us. I give you that. But the 11th step does not say achieved through prayer and meditation. It says sought. And on those mornings where one of us, both or one or both went back to sleep, we sought. And that's about as good as we'll ever do. But that's part of our commitment to each other. We also on a, I say a couple of times a month basis, spend some times in the evening after we're in bed with the lights out, praying for particular individuals. Someone we know that's in pain. Uh, we have a, a, a daughter whose who's due date is Monday with her first child. It'll be our first granddaughter. And uh, we've been sending a lot of love in that direction. We're going to talk about that. Uh, one of the things we're going to do tomorrow afternoon is what we call love meditation. And it's something that came out of the first men's retreat that I was involved in uh, in 1989. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. But that's those, those are some of the things that we do to try to hold ourselves together. We also meditate together mornings, and we're going to talk about meditation. Uh, our typical morning is 10 minutes of prayer and meditation in each other's arms, second alarm. I get We get up, she makes coffee, I shower and shave. We meet on the sofa. Um, I read two pages from the big book. I read two pages a day, just two. I read the big book four times a year like that. I've been doing it for over 20 years, and I've gotten, I'm have i almost familiar with it now. I, there's new <laughs> stuff. You know how you ever notice there's new stuff all the time? In, well, they are sneaking into your bedroom. And changing that, and and um, if we have the time, I'm going to cover some of the things they've changed recently. We'll we'll get to the hooks. I swear this thing's alive. Um, we read some other non non conference spiritual things, and then we do a meditation that lasts anywhere from three or four minutes to as much as about twenty, and that's how we start our days. So did they say uh, do the next right thing? Is that something you all say around here? I discovered a last right thing, and the last right thing is to go to bed in an hour and set an alarm so that I can have a good night's sleep and awaken the next morning with plenty of time to start my day on a spiritual basis. If I fail to do the last right thing tonight, I won't be able to do the first right thing tomorrow morning. So for me, there's a last right thing. Uh, Lynn and I say grace over meals. We, we Tonight in a restaurant, we just hold each other's hands and bow our heads for a few moments, and we say a silent grace. Uh, when we have the family together, it's out loud. So we're praying together five times a day. Something else I think is really, really important um, is that we compliment each other. I tell her how beautiful she is. It's easy to remember. But uh, but we compliment each other a lot. And uh, and I want to tell one more story. I'm going to turn it back over to her. I had, uh, had an interesting situation. A number of years ago, uh, our family ran out of milk on Christmas Day. So at halftime, I raced out to the car and roared down to the convenience store, raced into the back, grabbed the gallon of milk, raced up the gallon. You don't ever know when you're going to get one of these things. And I, was, I received a gift. And the gift was this part of me saw a human being standing in a convenience store, probably working for minimum wage on Christmas Day. 
and there was no longer a vehicle for me to get the milk, but 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 someone who deserved love. And the gift I got was that this part of me saw and opened up and said to him, "Thank you for working on Christmas Day, man. I bet there's some place you'd rather be." But you see, my family ran out of milk. If you hadn't come to work today, I couldn't have gotten it. I really appreciate you being here. It doesn't always move me when I tell this, but it did that day. I cried. He did too. And what a gift that was. And that's that compliment thing I just talked about. I just said thank you. That's all. I just said thank you. I'm very careful on the weekends. We fly a lot on weekends to thank people who are working. All the airline people are working. So I can get where I'm going. I can get, where I'm, I can get back. Um, I'm under a, a assignment by my sponsor. One of my standing assignments is to spread the joy. That's my assignment. And he means it. And part of how I do that is I compliment people. And I say thank you. And I think it's so, so important to do that. In tradition, too, the first words that jump out to me are a loving God. And I love the process of God through our steps and traditions. If you look at the uh, step one, it says uh, um, pow- a higher power, power greater than ourselves. And then by three, we get a God of our understanding. And then later in the steps, we get just God. And by the time we get to the second tradition, we get a loving God. And what a beautiful combination, because none of these traditions would work in my relationships if I did not have a loving God, that I could take his hand when I had to go into some scary situations or, you know, some of those dark caves like step four and five, you know, those scary things. So I love it that we get to have a loving God by the time we get to the second tradition. And um, Scott was talking about priorities. And one of our relation canoe understanding is that in our marriage, in our relationship, God will always be first. And so you move down to second place. Guess what's in second place? Our programs. Because if we don't have our individual programs, those individual rails, then we have nothing to to bring to each other. And we're in third place. And sometimes we're not even in third place. If Scott's got a big business deal going on, then he's really focused on that. Um, five years ago, our oldest daughter, when she was pregnant with the twins, um, she had to go on bed rest for four months, the last four months of that pregnancy. So she and her husband, we had a family meeting, a tribe meeting, tribal meeting, and we decided the best way to keep her healthy and these twins healthy was for them to move into our home. So during that four months, I think, Scott, there were a lot of days did not receive third place in my life. And because I was cooking three meals, I was um, <laughs> doing snacks. And can I tell that? I said I knew I was in an Al Anon slip because I was shaving my daughter's legs more often than my own. <laughs> they always understand that at women's conferences, okay? But but that's just the way it was. And so sometimes God, ha- sometimes we get bumped out of third place. But if we know that we have the shared vision, we have the commitment that we're not going to get out of this relationship unless we tell the other person. That's one of our understandings. Um, and I trust um, that you talk about trusted servants. I had to, uh, the ship of trust had been blown out of the water by the time I got to Alamon because I had participated in untrustful events. I had been untrustful in my own life. Um, I think trust is the opposite of, or the same thing as being vigorously honest. You know, I'd go into work and I'd say, oh, man, I didn't sleep at all last night. And in truth, I might have only been up about an hour or so. You know, I had a, I wasn't trustworthy in my actions or my words. And so I started hanging out with, with trusting servants. And the first thing I started to trust was that I'd go to a meeting at 8 o'clock and the meeting would be there. Or I would call my sponsor and she would agree to meet me someplace. I started hanging around with trustworthy people. I started being trustworthy. And that's what they were, trusted servants, but they do not govern. In fact, in our literature, if we look up relationships and start the readings, you know, it has the, the index in the back of the one day at a time, encourage to change, and then hope for today. They have all of these little um, things like self-pity, self-control, sarcasm, and they have relationships. And if you look up the word relationship in our Al-Anon literature, most of the readings are going to be around sponsorship. 
And in truth, the sponsorship was my first healthy, with my sponsor, that was my first healthy relationship because she was able to tell me the truth. Not always what I wanted to hear, but she was, she always told me the truth. So, um, and I think that, uh, you know, trusting, I can get bumped out of third place because I trust Scott that, that he's not going to go away or he's not going to force me to go away without just openly saying that. We have an agreement that neither one of us will act out or misbehave to try to push the other one away. You know, every uh, romantic relationship I ever got in, I kept my track shoes at the back door, and I always thought it was a way that I could control the pain. I knew you were going to leave, so I thought I could control when I was going to hurt if I'd be the first one out the door. Well, as long as I was holding on to that, how could I really be in the deal? As long as I've got my escape route planned, how could I really be in the deal? So that's what I had to show up and be trustworthy. So uh, going on then to tradition number three, it says the relatives of alcoholics when gathered together for mutual aid may call themselves an Al-Anon family group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. The only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a relative's or friend. Or friend. So, you know, probably just about everybody in this room kind of qualifies. I've already said that. But I love this, the first part of this. I used to read this in my mind like this. It says, the relatives of, the, the relatives of alcoholics, when gathered together for mutual aid, may call themselves, and I used to say, may call the police. Because <laughs> any time our family was gathered together, that's what would usually happen, that we would call the police. But uh, so what is mutual aid? I think, I think mutual aid is, is something that, that is, is, is the give and take. And I think our mutual aid has, uh, we've been married for 12 years, coming up on 12 years, and we were in a relationship a couple of years before that. And in fact... <laughs> We're going to add up all of the years that we've been married, not to each other, but the, the, oh. we, just whole years that we've been married, and we're going to have a 127th wedding anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. It's just an anniversary of how long you've been married. It's just an excuse for a party and just, looking for one That's life. right. Just to, so I think our mutual aid, quite honestly, has, has changed a little bit. Maybe as the relationship has changed, but more differently than that, I think as, as our chronological age has changed. We have to give each other mutual aid um, a little differently. Like, I, I, we're both having to repeat things over. What? What would you say? <laughs> You're going to have to come in here if you want me to hear that. I mean, we, mutual aid has to, has to change sometimes. You know, um, whether it's mutual aid of opening the door, I love that, opening the doors for each other, um, um, picking up the dry cleaning if he's got a busy day. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can find to do mutual aid. We, the al has a, a great little uh, just-for-today thing, and if you wanted how to jumpstart your day or how to do mutual aid or how to carry on, this is, this is a great little bookmark. And one of the things it says on here, it says, try to do something nice for somebody and not get caught. I guess that's humility. Because, and you know, uh, several years ago I came up with something that I've been doing for a long time. And every time I come up to this point, I have to just, because I want to tell it so much because I'm thinking, maybe you haven't figured something out that you could do for somebody and not ever get caught. Well, I really have figured out something. But I can't tell it because then I wouldn't have it. You know what I mean? So anyway, so so find out how you can do mutual aid. I, I, one of the things that I suggest to my sponsees is that when you're talking to somebody, you just send them good thoughts. You know, um, and I kind of learned this in the negative way. When, uh, when I was in my former marriage and I was working with my sponsor, I would say, but I just have this hardest time talking to him. I just really, I have this hardest time. She says, well, honey, just pretend there's a neon sign above his head flashing on and off. Disease, disease, <laughs> disease. <laughs> so I thought, okay, if, if we're communicating that way, what about loving thoughts? So when, when I'm listening to Scott or listening to my parents or the children or one of my sponsees, I'm I'm listening to their words, but I'm also thinking, I love you. 
I care about you. I, I hope you have a great day. You know, I send out that energy to people for, for, for mutual aid. I really do hope you have. I hope you have a great time this afternoon. I hope you have a great time this evening. I really, really want that for the globe, for, for the world. Okay, so the other one is that we have no other affiliation. The only requirement for membership is that we have a problem of alcoholism in a relative or friend. You know, um, Al-Anon believes that alcoholism is a family illness. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're all affected by it. It's like, it's like the whole family unit is immobile, like these lights. These lights are kind of suspended there, but if you took one light and put a heavy weight on it, if it gets weighted down by alcoholism, say this light right here, if it started drinking and it gets really, or if we just put water in that globe, or if we put alcohol in that one globe, that whole thing would, would come uneven. That whole thing, that whole light fixture would be affected. And that's what alcohol, alcoholism does. That's what Al-Anon believes. And what I believe, by being hanging around Al-Anon for almost 20 years, I believe that recovery can be just as, um, you know, attractive, as just as a force to pull somebody towards you. Uh, we're very blessed. Sometimes alcoholism skips generations, but I don't think the isms do. And, um, and we're very blessed. We have family members that are, are in recovery. Um, our oldest daughter, her husband, uh, our, our daughter that's expecting has had a lot of, um, recovery. Our youngest daughter who just turned 30, um, she's, she was in Alateen and she didn't, you know, I thought that was going to be the bell that I'd put around her and she'd never have any trouble with the disease of alcoholism, that Alateen was going to be the protective shield. And, um, she says interesting things like, well, mom, how am I going to know whether or not I'm an alcoholic if I don't drink? I mean, I love, the, I love the logic of that. And, and she may not be. I don't know. Um, she's, she's pretty much the dear Abby. She's pretty much the loaner of the money and the designated driver. She may just be pure Al-Anon. But she did not transition from Alateen to Al-Anon meetings. But this is what she says. Mom, when, um, when our family gets together, a meeting breaks out. Now, <laughs> what a blessing that is. If all the spots of the disease are going to break out, what a great blessing to have all the spots of recovery break out. I mean, I am so thankful for that. That doesn't mean that we don't have any problems. Oh my goodness, we do. We're, 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 we're a family. Um, we have, my, my aging parents, we have four generations that live in Nashville. That's probably four generations of problems that, that, that we're working on and that, that we're doing it together, uh, with, you know, the only requirement is that we're in this family and we're trying to do the deal. We're trying to stay in the deal. In tradition three, the only requirement is the desire. I love the word desire. Desire. It's important in this particular relationship. It's a desire to be in it. And I think it's in any relationship. I desire to be sponsored by the man that sponsors me. I desire to sponsor the man that I sponsor. I desire to be involved in business deals with the people I'm involved in. If I don't, then why am I in there? Why is somebody else running my life? I think it's a pretty good question. Part of that also for us, and this has been a, a real saver for us, is we don't work each other's programs. I can't sponsor her and she can't sponsor me. I've seen people try that. I've sponsored guys that have tried that. Yeah, those are fun. Those are fun. But she said we don't have rules and we don't, but we do have a couple of understandings. And one of them is that either one of us can go to the other one with either one of these two questions and get a positive response. When I hear one of these questions from her, I've already committed, I will give a positive response. The first one is, how long has it been since you've been to a meeting? If I hear that, I'll go to the next one. And I will not complain, and she will too. And the other one is, would you be willing to talk to your sponsor about that? <laughs> and the answer to that always has to be yes, and it also has to contain a smile. And we have committed to those things. And I think those are good questions, and, and those are the kinds of things that I can agree with with other people. Can we say these things to each other? Can we call each other on them? And I think it's important that we do that. We've defined our relationship. I'm free to go. I'm free to stay. I desire to be here. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or as a whole. I looked up the word autonomous. It says having the right or power of self-government, self-contained. 
So what that means is that we're a unit. I don't give uh, what belongs to her to someone else, emotionally or physically. Um, I think that's really, really important. When uh, Linda talked about having family members in recovery, we've got some that aren't. We're sure of it. And... Uh, <laughs> Or I am. I shouldn't speak for us, but I'm certain of it. And and it's a good family member. I have to spend a certain amount of time with some of these people, but I, I limit it because um, very judgmental on my part. This is my analysis of it. Their sickness is stronger than my recovery at times. And uh, I come back weird as a football bat sometimes from some of these little encounters. And uh, and so. My my modus operandi on that is first I tell Linda when I'm heading into that situation. Number one, that she, so that she'll know. Number two, that I get her support. Prayer in the morning, she prays for me while I'm there. If I'm having a, a big deal business kind of meeting, I get her prayer support while that's going on. She wants to know when that is. And then when I come back and I'm stretched and, and weird and snappy, she doesn't take it personally because she expected that. And she, the reason she expected it is because I told her the truth on the front end. So we stay open with communication on that. And I think these things are terribly, terribly important. The other thing is that uh, I've learned that she needs to get my news first. We had a blow here a, a few months ago on this from somebody in the family where we deserve to hear something some other way than the way we heard it. And uh, the, the day I got that lesson, I, I fan- I'm a storyteller. I fancied myself a writer. I'm not a writer. But I, I wrote what I alleged was a novel. It's actually some uh, combined experiences. I flew for the Air Force for five years, and it's a group of those put together as a novel. And I had just typed. Uh, we were we were in Florida on vacation. I just typed the last word, and the phone rang. It was a guy I sponsor. I said, "Hey, I just finished my book." And boy, I felt it just flew all over. I felt like something exploded inside me. And I thought he doesn't deserve to be the first one to hear that. She did. And that was where I, that's, that was where that lesson really set for me. I, I knew it. I knew it, but I didn't know it down here. I didn't have what Linda calls heart knowledge. I didn't realize it. It wasn't real for me. And uh, it became that way. I had an experience not too long after that where um, I came home earlier. I was home at like 2 o'clock one afternoon, and the youngest daughter still lived with us, and she was in college, and she'd made the dean's list. And uh, I was on the dean's list myself, but it was the other list. And uh, she was, <laughs> yeah, she had like these fabulous grades. And she was just all bubbly and everything. I talked to Linda on the phone at least twice before she got home and maybe three times. And I didn't tell her because it wasn't my news. She deserved, the daughter deserved to be the one that told her. They deserved to be able to celebrate that together. And so what I've learned is the lesson of whose news is it? Because I think it's really, really important for autonomy, for who, who really does own that and who deserves to hear it first. It's the kind of thing that I have to slow down. I think, I think the two most difficult things I've run into in my recovery are one day at a time, which means not just don't drink today, but live only in this day. And the other one is easy does it, is to bring myself down from Mach 2 with my hair on fire to being present in my own life moment to moment to the point where I can respond instead of react. And the difference between a reaction and a response is that a response has a pause. And it is in that pause that I can make a conscious decision as to what to do. Back when I was drinking, everything was reaction because I was damage control all the time. Maybe it was crashing down constantly. And I was head and shoulders fake, well, you know what I mean. And, and so I'm not living that way anymore. And those old habits die hard. So I have to back away. Do you know the difference between a good habit and a bad habit, by the way? Good habits are easy to break. That's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference. And so if I'm going to have good habits, I'm going to have to pay the price for them. And uh, and I've got this in my notes here, and I don't know why. Uh, oh, it has to do with autonomy. A couple of years ago, Miss Linda and I were sitting in front of the TV. I was watching the U.S. Open Golf Tournament on television. And she was spending time with her husband. Do you understand the difference? And and uh, and we had and we had the sound turned off. If you ladies are wondering why the man has to have the remote, it isn't to find out what's on TV. It's to find out what else is on TV. Okay, and uh, but anyway, we had the sound turned off. We we're kind of chatting, but there was a Japanese fellow was in contention. He was a stroke or two off the lead, and they were, they were showing a lot of his shots. 
And at this one particular point, this guy hit this horrible shot. looked like one of mine. And uh, they came in close on his face. And you could tell he was in pain. I mean, this man was in anguish. And Linda says, oh, I hope he doesn't commit karaoke. <laughs> Well, I hope so, too. I, I, I've been there when people have committed karaoke. Uh, part of our autonomy is that I have her permission to tell that story. She's so comfortable in her own skin. She's okay with herself that it doesn't bother her. That She's a little bit dyslexic, and she mixes the words every once in a while. And we all find it hilarious, and she's not offended by it. That's something to watch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um Autonomous is a big word, and I think it's such an important word. In fact, I think it is probably the most Al-Anon word in the whole traditions because I had to have autonomy to realize what my truths were, and I had to find out what my truths were before I could speak them. You know, it was hard for me to take the first step because I was given a lot of power. Oh, um, the car had a flat tire? That was my fault. Or we got bad service at a restaurant that I picked out? Well, somehow that was my fault. So, see, that seemed like power. It seemed like I had the power to control those things. And if I had the power to control those things, it was really under the disguise of blame. But I thought I had that power, so I thought I must be responsible for, for making you happy. And what I know about autonomous is that, that my truths are, I know what I like to do. I like to sing off-key. I like to dance. I like to paint, kindergarten paint. I, I can tell you, I can get excited over that quilting shop that we went in today, and I don't quilt. You know, I just, I just know, I just know who I am. My autonomy, finally, from working the steps and hanging out with you guys, finally, all of my ages have shown up at the same time. My emotional age, my spiritual age, and my physical age. I turned 60 last year, and finally, my emotions are not that of a five-year-old. Or when I was five, six, and seven, I was like an adult. And then when I became an adult, I tried to act like an adult, but I was a scared little kid. So finally, all of me has shown up at the same time. And, and to me, that's I, I have matured all of me to the same place at the same time. And to me, that's, that's a definition. I have recovered, re, not totally recovered, but I have recovered those pieces of me. And so I do have autonomy. And the, the, the little cheat sheet for autonomy, if you want to know how you can be self-sufficient and how you can make sure the other people around you are, you've got this little cheat sheet from Al-Anon called detachment. And it says that detachment is neither kind or unkind, it just is. And it says such wonderful things. It says not to manipulate situations so others will eat, go to bed, get up, pay bills, not drink, or behave as we see fit. Oh, I think this should be subtitled, Let the Adults in Your Life Be Adults. You know, my daughter told me, who's, she's coming up on um, 16 years, 17 years this month. Wow. That's, a, that's sober in AA. Sober not, in not AA, an yeah. No, oh no, no. She's, no. But isn't that amazing? Um, AA parented her so beautifully. And, and I got enough Al Anon that I stopped uh, enabling her. And she told me, she said, Mom, the day you treated me like an adult was the day I believed I could be one. And I did it by this little thing of detachment. And the one I love about this one, it says, Not to allow ourselves to be used or abused by others in the interest of another's recovery. Whether or not the alcoholics in my life stay sober or choose to drink, that's not any of my business. But my Al-Anon program is just as important to me. I was dying and old and all used up before I got into Al-Anon. I can just tell you that. I, I, you think Al-Anon, uh, you think the disease, this disease is so powerful it kills people that don't even have it. Think about that one. So um, so I had to learn my truth so I, for, but before I could become autonomous. Okay, number five. I love this one. It says, each Al-Anon family group has but one purpose, to help families of alcoholics. We do this by practicing the 12 steps of AA ourselves, by encouraging and understanding our alcoholic relatives, and by welcoming and giving comfort to the families of alcoholics. One thing I like about this one, I don't know, those of you who haven't gone to Al-Anon meetings or maybe that you don't know this, but... Um, 
there, for, for, for as long as I've been in Al-Anon, there's been a controversy about the big book. The big book is not conference-approved literature for Al-Anon. Okay? Now, when I first got into Al-Anon, I was taken through the steps by using the big book. I don't talk about that in a lot of meetings because their group conscience says that they used only conference-approved literature. But this little tradition kind of, to me, is like permission. It says, um, we do this by practicing the 12 steps of AA ourselves. Well, what better way to learn about the 12 steps is to take a peek into the big book. Uh, it's got to the uh, the chapter to the wives and to the family afterward. I ha- I I still have my big book. I'll have it down there, in in all of our my books down there. The first big book I got my hands on when I was in my former marriage, and I have to show it to you because I underlined in red everything I thought he should read. <laughs> You think I didn't qualify for Al-Anon on that? Sick. Yeah, that was that was that was pre-Al-Anon. So, so I, but I think that it's okay for us to take a peek. Um, let's learn everything we can about the disease. Uh, my sponsor encouraged me to go to open AA meetings to learn about the relationships of the individual and their relationship to the drink. She said, "Don't go there to talk or to share or to participate in the meeting." She said, "You go there." to hear the stories of hope, and to learn the lessons that they're trying to learn. So to me, that's that's what that's about. And this last one is that we give encouragement and understanding to our alcoholic relatives, and we give welcome and comfort to the families of alcoholics. So how do we give comfort? You know, one way I think that we can give comfort is by doing safe humor. I'm talking about belly laughing that we have in our meetings sometimes. I'm not talking about sarcasm. In my home growing up, in an alcoholic home, and maybe you experienced this too, we confuse sarcasm with humor. We, we thought that if somebody came walking in and they said, hey, I see you're wearing an extra spare tire, meaning the person had gained weight, we thought that was funny and we'd laugh. We, the, the humor was always at somebody, else, at somebody else's expense. And I don't think that's a way to give comfort. But I think humor is a way to give comfort. So in our household, we have an understanding, and our understanding is the 10-minute rule. You can tease somebody, you can joke about something, if it's something that they can change in the next 10 minutes. Then that's okay. Does that make sense? Uh, Scott says the, the you tell the... The example of that, and then I'll... We were at a trade show one time and uh, in a hotel, and I was working a booth, and it was, it was a coat and tie kind of affair. And among other things, I was wearing two shoes. If you will think about it, that could be different from, like, a pair of shoes, for example. <laughs> it's possible that that would be different. And it was that day. It was one black and one brown. And I just, just didn't happen to notice it that morning. And... Uh, and she teased me about that. She went and got everybody I knew to come see me wearing one brown shoe and one black shoe. And it was funny because I could have fixed it in 10 minutes. I could have gotten on the elevator and gone up because I had another pair just like them. I could have changed. And, uh, but it was something, it was something that I could have changed in 10 minutes. The word sarcasm comes from the Latin and it means tearing of flesh. And that's what sarcasm is. And I grew up in a home where, where that, that, uh, was interchangeable with humor also. Were you through with that one? And the, the other way to give comfort is, is to, uh, to be aware of what's going on in their lives, not to control it or to, to be so focused on it that you miss something going on in your life, but to just be aware. And uh, the example that I want to use is um, Scott, had, we, we, had, we live in Nashville, Tennessee, and we have a house in Florida, which is uh, 450 miles door to door. That's a long drive. And uh, Scott had been working all weekends for trade shows. In his industry, he has trade shows. So he had worked during the weeks, and he'd worked like three weekends in a row. And we had really looked at the calendar, and we saw how we could scrape out, um, I think, like a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, and Sunday, four days. So we were going to go to our Florida house for a little vacation to get away. And and I, I'm seeing him load up the car. That night, we're going to get up real early the next morning, and we're going to drive all the way down there on Thursday, 450 miles. We're going to stay two days, and then we're going to turn around and drive back. And that night, I saw him exhausted. And I said, um, what if we don't go on our vacation? 
And he goes, what do you mean? Uh, Because we'd already put some things in the car. And I said, well, what if we don't do all the driving? We still have a holiday. People come to Nashville all the time for a vacation. Why don't we just hang out here? Our sponsees know that we're going to be out of town, that it's emergency only. Our family members won't bug us because they think we're going to be out of town. Why don't we just hang out the Do Not Disturb sign and say, stay right here and pick up two extra days? And that's what we did. We went to movies. We slept in, we ate out, we went to meetings that we don't normally go to because when we're out of town, we go to other meetings. Um, let's see, we shopped, we acted like tourists, and uh, and it, it was it was giving comfort to him. It didn't have anything to do directly with drinking or not drinking. It had to do with giving comfort, and we picked up some some extra holidays. That that was a that was a fun thing. That was quite a gift she gave me. I'm not sure that I could have done that, and I didn't know enough to, to say anything about it. I want, in, the, in the AA tradition, five, it uses the words primary purpose, and I had an experience. I think I was sober around two years. I was in my evangelical phase, and, um, <laughs> and I was in the kitchen of the old Woodbine Club a few minutes before a meeting having a discussion with another member. Now, not being as spiritually evolved as I am, if you'd witnessed it, you might have thought it was an argument. About about something extremely important, about, and I can't quite remember what that was right now, but um, uh, something on the order of am I recovered or recovering alcoholic, something really needed. And, and uh, we weren't getting anywhere with it, and we were getting a little bit louder. And about that time, old Joe B. walked in. Now, Joe had been sober since a month before the earth began to cool and was a highly intelligent individual, those two characteristics, clearly putting him on my side of this burning issue, which I still can't seem to remember what it was. And uh, as he poured his coffee, I posed this question to him. And when I finished, he said to me, I said, what do you think, Joe? And he said, I am not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Do not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorse nor oppose any causes. My primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And, uh, and by the time he finished, we were laughing. And it took me a while. It took me actually several months. I... I, had, I call it a revelation, and I have a definition for you of revelation. Revelation is when I figure out for myself something you've been trying to tell me for six months or longer. <laughs> okay, right? That's a revelation. If you, anybody here that sponsors knows that's a revelation, right? And um, I went to Joe, and I said, you meant that? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Joe was living the AA preamble, and he didn't, let, he didn't engage in controversy, and he didn't let anything get between him and staying sober. And he didn't let anything get between him and carrying this message. Anything. And he's one of the most peaceful, happy men I've ever known in my whole life. That's what primary purpose means. It means we don't let anything get in between. And so in a relationship, what's the primary purpose? And I believe it's spiritual growth for everyone involved. We can't let anything get in the way of that. The price is too high. That leaves us with four commitments in this situation that we're in. I'm committed to my growth. I'm committed to her growth. She's committed to my growth. She's committed to her growth. That's four, and they're separate. They're separate. I came out of a relationship where I was committed to my growth. I was committed to her growth. She was committed to my growth, and she was just fine. Thank you very dead gum much and leave me alone. That didn't work. It requires all four. The other thing that it requires is that I have to be willing to hurt her. Not intentional. But I have to embrace the truth. And the truth is that as we, as I grow, as I uncover things in my past, that old stuff that I'm still hanging on to, a lot of the ways I find it is when I've damaged her. That's going to be part of the process. And I, th- I think the first lie any of us ever believed was, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> it ain't so. It ain't so. That's not the package. Part of our other commitment is we're committed to each other's sponsorship. And I want to give you an example of that. Um, oh, on a Wednesday night, and I told you we have our couple up day Wednesday night, we sat down to a candlelight dinner. The al phone rang. We have an AA phone and al phone. It's one of the reasons we're still together. And <laughs> the al phone rang, and she went in the other room and answered it. And uh, she was gone about 30 minutes. And I sat there on date night and ate my candlelight dinner alone with a good attitude, a smile on my face, because I knew, I knew that if that was not emergency, if there wasn't blood on the floor somewhere, she would have said, I can't talk to you now. It's Wednesday afternoon. We'll talk tomorrow. The fact that she took that call 
gave me all the information I needed. I am committed to her sponsorship, and I trust her. I believe when she does something, it's a good move. She's got good reason for it. And that's such a gift for me because I don't have to continue to judge her and try to figure all that out. In the same sense, she uh, she supports, I have the privilege. Anybody here taking meetings into corrections? Anybody? See the hands? Good. I got handouts. I got stuff I want to give you. We got some neat stuff going on in Nashville and corrections. I've been involved in a lot of some, I want to show it to you. Please come see me. Um, but I go to jail quite frequently. And uh, so I heard her, someone asked her one time, what do you think about all the time Scott spends in jail? She said, I love it because I love who he is when he comes out of there because I get the gift when I go in there. But she supports that. I give about about a night a week to that kind of thing. And I have her support for it because she understands that's part of what I have to do to be the guy that I am. Uh, that was five. This is six. An AA group but never endorsed finance or lend the AA named any related facility or outside enterprise. Less problems of money, property, or prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Well, we've established our primary purpose. This is one of two traditions that really kind of talk a little bit about finance. Um, we have uh, business meetings, Linda and I do. And speaking of finance, I would observe, too, is, uh, the current count on the traditions is 12. There's not a 13th tradition. There appears to be that the 13th tradition is you put exactly $1 in the basket. That was the 13th tradition when I got sober in the summer of 1984, and cigarettes were 52 cents a pack if that gives you any perspective. You might think about that. There's an upper limit as to how much money you can give to your central office a year. It's $2,000. There's an upper limit as to how much money you can give to AA World Services a year. It's $2,000. wonder why they have to have a limit. Hmm. Yeah, might think about that. Um, but we discussed finances. Um, we have business. We don't catch it. We do it some on the fly, but we sit down and have business meetings. And we know that's what they are. We turn the phones off. Um, we have a spending limit. Linda and I have a number in our minds right now. It's the same number. It's something we've agreed to. And neither one of us will ever spend more than that amount of money at any given time without consulting the other one. doesn't mean I don't get a new sport coat when I need one. When I need one. It means I don't come home to a pedigreed cat, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. I did that. I, I, somebody spent a lot of my money on a pedigreed cat. I, I mean, forgive me, I think a cat's a complete waste of fur. And so, I, I mean, that's just, I couldn't believe it. it. It means I don't come home to a new sports car in the driveway. I had that experience. So, and, and we have reduced that since we set our spending limit the first time. We've reduced it twice, maybe three times. It's now dramatically smaller than it was because well, our financial situation has changed. But it's something that we've agreed to. We've agreed to short and long-term goals. Uh, one of the things I learned from Linda was uh, to pray while I'm paying the bills. I hope you like that chime. I do. It seems kind of um, jarring friendly, okay? Um, now, Scott finished up on, uh, well, wait a minute. Before, before we start, let's do just another moment of silence and just breathe in. And, and I'm so happy to see people... Um, Yes. And turn off our cell phones. And turn off our cell phones. Yeah, if your cell phone goes off in this next session, you're buying coffee and pie for everybody. <gasps> and ice cream? Yes. I know where the Baskin Robbins is. Okay, Greg, are we going to... Hi, welcome back to the uh, traditions, using the traditions and relationships. And uh, let's just have a moment of silence and uh, just breathe for just a minute. Breathing's always good. Thank you. Uh, Scott finished his part about uh, tradition number six. I would like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the words that I really appreciate this are our primary spiritual aim, and it says, although a separate entity, we should always cooperate with Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, several years ago, I was introduced to a, a women's retreat called Woman to Woman, and they were started out in California over 20 years ago. And the idea behind the Woman to Woman was um, to bridge the uh, see to bridge the gap between AA and Al-Anon women. 
And I think that that was, might have been true back then. Uh, we started one in Tennessee, a woman to woman last year. We're having our second one this year. I, I brought a couple of flyers. That was a commercial for that. Um, but what we're calling it is a gathering of AA and Al-Anon women. Because I said bridging the gap sounds like there's still a problem. And, you know, maybe there is. Maybe we still, um, think that there's a division. And there is a separation. It's a separate entity. AA and Al-Anon is separate. But we do have to cooperate. I get really um, interested in talking to some of Scott's sponsees, and he says, um, you know, m- my wife's an al just not working for her. And I said, well, does she go to meetings? And he says, no, he thinks that she's an al just because he's an AA. Well, that just because you are married to an alcoholic doesn't make you an al member. What makes you an al member is when you go to al meetings. Several years ago, some uh, AA women called me to ask if I would sponsor them for Al-Anon, and I said, not unless you go to meetings, because if you don't go to meetings, then there's, you don't need an Al-Anon sponsor. So our agreement there is uh, this one woman that I'm still working with is over 10 years sober. She stays very closely connected to her AA sponsor, because if she doesn't have sobriety, then there's no need for any type of program. In fact, we, but we have a friend, he says, um, what is is AA, as AA membership keeps him from committing suicide, and his Al-Anon program keeps him from uh, homicide. from homicide. Yeah, <laughs> one is a suicide prevention, the other is a homicide prevention. Okay, so our primary spiritual aim, and although a separate entity, I think again, staying in the moment is what allows me to do this tradition. And my best example of that is another time Scott and I were heading down to our, our house in Florida. And what had happened is uh, my daughter had given me a canoe for uh, my birthday. And it's a canoe that I named Yard Art because it seems to stay in the yard more than it stays in the river. But well, we're working on that. But we decided to take it down to the Florida house. And we started this traveling 450 miles. We started it in the daytime, and then it got night which, you know, that always makes the trip longer. And then it started raining, and we were in our pickup truck, and the canoe was tied on the front. And as the wind and the highway, you know, whatever that's called, wind, um, it would move the canoe back and would have to stop the pickup truck, and Scott would have to get out and push the canoe back forward or we were going to lose it. In the rain. And then it started raining, so he's having to do that in the rain. And he's driving... And my job is to watch the canoe, and when it got to a certain point, I had to tell him or remind him that he was going to have to get out, get in the rain, and go around and push the canoe back up and get back in the car. And so I hated my job. I'm watching that get closer and closer, and I'm going, I don't want to have to tell him that he's got to get out. And the tension in that cab of that pickup truck was absolutely frightening, and it reminded me so much of how I used to live all the time. And then I I thought, we have a spiritual aim here, and it is not to live the way we used to. You know, I just wasn't going to let him white-knuckle the the whole trip, and I'm there just hating that this I'm going to have to be the one to tell him when this stops. I just hated the situation, but we needed to get on. I mean, there didn't seem any other solution so I, I did a prayer, and I was given a kind of a crazy thought, but I said, um, hey, and he's over there, you know. I said, what, why don't we play recovery trivia? What's that? And that's what he said, what's that? And I said, well, I don't know for sure, but I think it goes like this. I will say a slogan or a phrase, and you say a slogan or a phrase, like easy does it one day at a time, let go and let God, all of the ones that we're used to. And then we got into those like, call your sponsor, eat and meet and, do you have eat and meet and here? And then, I mean, we kept and coming up with one, and I'd finally come up with one, and I'm thinking, this will be the last one. He'll never get another one on me. And then he would come up with another one. I bet we came up with over 300 sayings. It was ridiculous. We are laughing so hard. And and I'd say, oh, you got to go do the canoe. And he would jump out of the car because he couldn't wait to get back in to play the game some more. You know, nothing had happened except our primary spiritual aim was that we're not going to live the way we used to. We're going to bring joy and celebration in. 
we're going to have a, a, a unit that's going to be happy, joyous, and free. And we had a blast. And, and the time flew by. We, we, the miles flew by and, and that's all that had changed, our attitude. And, and I think that's one of the hardest lessons I've ever learned in, and I have to keep learning in Al-Anon, that it's okay for me to be happy. That you're not gonna kick me out if, if the drama goes away. You know? And, and my other thing that I believe with all my heart, that there's no limit to how happy God wants us to be. I used to think that happiness was like a spigot. If I laughed too loud, it was gonna get turned off. I do not believe that anymore. There's absolutely no limit to how happy God wants us to be. So um, so have fun and, and play that. And, and your primary spiritual aim can be be of good cheer, I guess. Uh, and now number seven, uh, every group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. You know, of all of the 12 traditions, I think that there are, what, two, two of them, at least two, that have to do with money depending on how you read the next one, maybe three that have to do with money. I think that it's so important about how we feel about money. Now, in my household growing up, money was uh, the definition of love. My dad would misbehave and my mother would get another piece of jewelry. My parents were um, parents that came out of the Depression and they put a nice estate together. So they may not know, they didn't know how to give me emotional support, but they knew how to give me money, how to give me gifts. We always had a lot of packages under the tree. I mean, we really, and money looked like it meant control, and it looked like it meant reward, and it looked like it meant happiness. And that's what I took into my adult life. And I have to tell you that I got so into making money in real estate that I neglected my family the same way anybody would with a drug or a drink. I was so focused on making money and putting zeros in the bank that I would tell my daughters crazy things like, um, uh, y'all just fix your own dinner because I've got very important people in from out of town and I've got to take them out to dinner. So the message was, you're not as important as these people are. And I turned, I, I just focused on making money. So I believe part of our recovery and part of these traditions is we have to know how we feel about money. Because if you don't know how you feel about it, how can you express your attitudes and your feelings and your concerns about it? Um, worrying doesn't, doesn't change how much money's in the bank. Action does. I really believe that, that prosperity is, is, is the river. That sometimes it's, it's a high bank and we're in the high cotton, like they say, and we don't have to worry about budgets. And sometimes, no matter at, at what age we are or where we are in our lifetime, we have to just, just pull back. But I'm amazed. There's a story about a couple who were in early recovery and, um, and they were, they were really trying to do everything right and, and they were just really happy together. And, um, this guy's sponsor, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go speak at this conference, and I want you to come with me because I want you to introduce me. And we, we're going to pay for your way, but, but you are going to have to, because you want, we want you to participate also, you are going to need like X amount of money to, to go for maybe meals or something. And so this couple prayed about it, and, and they, they redid their money, and they, they knew this was a great thing for this new guy in recovery to get to go to this conference. And they'd put the money together, but I mean, they still needed like $12.23. It was some really unusual amount of money. They still needed $12.23 to come up with the amount that he needed to go to this conference. And she said, okay, let's don't worry about it, but I heard him say that when you introduce somebody, you're supposed to look nice and wear a coat. Let's go get your coat out and see if it still fits you, if we need to, you know, if I need to wash it or clean it up or anything. And he says, oh, that's a great idea. So he puts the coat on, he puts his hands in his pocket, and he pulls out $12.23. See, God God provides. And this is what I think we have to believe about money, that it's just for our use. It's it's not a score-keeping thing. But if we don't know how we feel about it, then we we can't talk about it. It's, it's, it's that thing over there. Money and sex. We have to know how to talk about the bedroom, and we have to know how we talk about money. 
I just threw out the word sex to see if y'all were still listening or if you dozed off. <laughs> we are going to talk about that. Uh, the other thing I want to say about the about money, as I, I saw this with the the young people when they were when my daughter was putting conferences together. These were kids that got sober and then they started putting conferences together or workshops together, dances together. They started handling money. They started having commitments. And I, at first I thought maybe we make too much about this, but I saw them learning skills. I saw the group having a treasurer and having a checkbook. I saw them mature around money issues because they were taking service commitments. So there's ways for us to grow up around money. You know, um, we don't have to wait for the tooth fairy to put it under the pillow. We can get out there on our own. Self-supporting is a pretty interesting concept. Uh, Linda and I both had major job changes. I actually had one since then. And uh, neither one of us raced into the change. We talked about it. We approached it prayerfully as a unit. And uh, it's important that we do it that way. Talking about money, uh, Linda and I don't have a church, but we tithe. There are ways that you can do that. If you see a place where God's work's being done, you can finance it. You can put some money in it. Um, you can. Uh, I'm the tape fairy of Middle Tennessee. I, I give away CDs and tapes like I carry them, give them to newcomers. I got my 30 or 40 favorites, and I got them with me all the time. If I find new people, and I don't loan them either. Yeah, loaning the tape is a good way to get a resentment. If you're short on resentments, I'll tell you how to get one. Dig out your favorite tape or CD and loan it to somebody. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> you need to give it a hug and a kiss because it's probably the last time you're going to see it. Um, but, but you can be – the other thing about self-support, it means if I mess it up, I clean it up. If I, lay, if I get it out, I put it back. I pick it up. I think it's important. Tradition 8. Alcoholics and Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. It's about non-professional. It means we don't give each other therapy. It also means it also means that we fight fair. It means no name calling. Ever. That's sarcasm. And we fight to completion. And uh, fight's kind of a poor choice of words. I don't know that we've had a fight. We've had some disagreements. We've gotten crosswise. It, it hadn't happened since this afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's the last time. It didn't happen very often, but we had but we had one today, and uh, and we used a little bit of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes today. And it's is the reason this is the last time we're ever going to do this workshop because it seems like every time we do one, this comes up, <laughs> yeah, and I'm getting tired of it. Yeah, yeah but um, we were we were given uh, by a friend a, a technique, a, a conflict resolution technique based on the Saint Francis prayer. It's to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. I've got it here on a piece of paper, and I've got enough for everybody. I, I hope you'll take one. But what it allows, someone asked us, we, the first time we used this thing, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do the first time. And the first time we ever used it, uh, within a week or so, we were at a gathering, a party of some kind in recovery, and we talked about this thing and how neat it was. And somebody said, have you ever used it? I said, well, yeah, we just used it about eight days ago. And they said, well, what was the fight about? And I said, well, it was, uh, it was uh, what was the fight about? And she didn't know either. And eight days later, we didn't know what it was about. And that is because we were complete. We were finished. I had heard her, she had heard me, and we'd gotten all the way to the end of it so that the next time something comes up, that's all we have to do. And this thing can be used with anybody. And I, I, I don't recommend a whole lot of stuff that's, that's not in the literature. These are things that we wrote out of our experience and the things that we've been given. And uh, this willingness to seek professional help, that's the other thing. If we get to where we absolutely can't do it ourselves... We seek a professional. And the big book recommends that, by the way, on page 133, if you don't have to be familiar with it. And uh, I, I think that's just terribly, terribly important. There's also um, a reading on page 118, and I sure hope I recognize what it is because I don't see it in my note. Um, oh, yeah. This is in the uh, chapter Two Wives, which a friend of mine says that's only misprint in the big book. It says two T.O. wives should be T.W. two. That's the average, but I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, third line says, next time you and he have a heated discussion, no matter what the subject, it should be the privilege of either to smile, I think it's an important piece, smile and say, this is getting serious, I'm sorry I got disturbed, let's talk about it later. How about that? Yeah. So uh, so we're not looking to be involved in a fight. That's, that's not part of what it is. I don't want to be right anymore. When we get crosswise, I want to know where my mistakes are. Is this my old stuff? Is this something where I need to make changes? Because if it is, I want to make it. If it's her, then I want to help her make them as easily as possible. If it's both of us, then I'm involved in that. I don't want to be right anymore. I have discovered the source of all anger, by the way, and it comes from being right. 
I have never been angry when I wasn't also right. Ever. I've been right when I wasn't angry. I've never been angry when I wasn't right. I don't want to be right anymore. I'd rather be free. You know, part of that uh, conflict resolution, the, the reason that's so important, it's because there's a reading in our Al-Anon that says, by the time we get to Al-Anon, we're starving to be heard. We just, we just need to be heard. And if we hear each other, then we can communicate. If I can speak my truth and you can react in a truthful way, then we have a better chance of, um, of resolving it. And uh, I used to, before Al-Anon and before all of this agreement like this, I used to um, round bag. I, you know, okay, he did that. Let me stick it in here. Uh, let me put it in this bag. And then I'd wait when something minor would happen, and I'd open up that sack, that bag, and throw it all on him at the same time, especially with my daughter. Uh, my daughter used to say that, I, you know, I'd never get upset that she stayed out partying late. But if I if she if I opened up the drawer and the last pair of pantyhose was gone, I'd absolutely throw a fit. I mean, I never was appropriately anger because it was always just built up till I just exploded. And so that resolution lets you do get finished, and so you're not dragging the next thing like Scott said into the next thing. Number eight, I love this. It says Alan on twelfth step work should remain forever non-professional, and. Um, there, I had to learn through Al-Anon that there's not a professional way to load the dishwasher. <laughs> you know, how, how many times have, have I would, would think, it's, it's, I just come in there and redo it. It's like my way or the highway. You know, there's not a... Excuse me, are we going to have to separate them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same thing about, about carrying out the trash. You know, if you, if the job just gets done, and if you have a family meeting, you might find out who really does like to do certain things and who really does like to do the other things. My, my daughters taught me this. I had one that always carried out the trash, one always emptied the dishwasher. I'm on them all the time. Carry out the trash, carry out the trash, empty the dishwasher. Empty. Finally, they came to me, and they said, we want to trade jobs. I'd rather do the dishes. And then and once they, once they said what they had preferred to do, then they did it without me having to push them into it. Scott and I have agreements like that, our business meeting. Um, it's my job to do the laundry. And, and I have to tell you that Scott thanks me every single time that I do his laundry. And I have to tell you that I don't do it professionally. I get it done. But I tell you another thing that I do, I love doing the laundry. And as I'm folding those clothes, those undergarments, I put little blessings because they're going to go with him all day. You know, I, I just, I really, I really, and I like the, the look of that, and it's, he's gonna put that cotton against him. I, I, I like doing the laundry. And he makes all of the, uh, flight reservations, because he's got our frequent flyer numbers, he knows, he knows how to, how to book those flights. I sometimes wonder, sometimes they'll invite me to go speak at an Al-Anon, and Scott won't be invited, but they'll call me and they'll say, now what time does your flight get in? And I'll say, I don't know. I'll have to ask my husband. And they're going, what kind of al did we invite, you know? <laughs> I have to ask him everything. But 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 he does that. And and I mow the grass. I like to mow the grass. And... I'm a nice guy. I let her. <laughs> <laughs> I am such a nice guy. I bought her a new lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and taking it to yet another level, I had the guy at the store assemble it for her. <laughs> <laughs> and I started for her too. Am I a prince or what? I uh, I like to do dishes. To me, it's playing in the water. The dishes don't bother me at all. So she mows, I do dishes. We are uh, we like to tell people that we are living without adult supervision. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Um. And that and that feels good about special workers. Let the let the people do what what calls to them, and see if they do it a little more willingly. Okay, tradition number nine says a group as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Um, I like this. If you think that we're never organized, just wait. If they say we're going to try to get in a circle to do the Lord's prayer. You can see we're not organized. You know, it, we, it's the hardest thing for a group to do. Get in a circle. Go. Okay, let's just make a snake. I mean, you know, skip the circle part because we're not form, yeah forming amoeba because we're just not very organized. And isn't that great? Because um, 
it, if you're not so organized, it's just not so restricted. It's just not so into perfectionism. And in truth, a lot of the spontaneity stuff happens that brings joy into our life. If we were so organized that, that, that it was so structured, then there wouldn't be any room for ebb and flow and for, for cheerfulness. Now, I do believe in these committees directly responsible. I do believe in that. Uh, it kind of goes back with special workers. Young couple, um, I think that they're in recovery. They've got jobs. They've got families. I think it's great for them to get a committee of babysitters and help somebody else out that's in the meeting that's looking for a job. Uh, one of my very best friends uh, got out of prison, and the AA office called me and said she really needs to clean some houses. Um, she's become a great friend, and she's now a counselor in a prison. Okay, but she started out by cleaning houses. I gave her a job um, when, you know, when when she needed a job. Um, so, so there, there. I think that we need to to take care of ourselves by allowing some of the budget to be used for babysitters and for possibly cleaning or or, or whatever. Uh, tradition 10, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name will never be drawn into public controversy. Let's talk a little bit about outside issues. Uh, part of that means that I don't plan our activities. She doesn't plan our activities. I had the experience in my first marriage of coming home from a very long business trip on a Friday evening to be told to get a shower and shave and put on a coat and tie. We're going out to dinner to a restaurant you don't like that we can't afford with people that you don't want to be with. Great. Great. Welcome home. Fantastic. And so so we don't commit each other. If you invite us to something through me, I'll say, I'll look at the calendar, talk to Lynn, and I'll get back to you. It may be that I'll come and she won't. We do that some. But, but neither one of us commits, both of us. Another part of that commitment, and I think it's a very, very important one, is that no one ever hears me say anything negative about my wife. Ever. Ever. I make a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, one is a professional counselor. Um, another one is herself. If I have a problem, I can take it to her. And the third one, um, I have the option to take it to my sponsor, if I don't mind hearing him say, and what did you do that made a fine woman like her respond to that kind of thing <laughs> like that? What did you do? And since I'm not fond of hearing that, I've pretty much scratched him off the list. It just, just for your, inf just sort of for your information. Um, but I, she talked about the negative energy. I don't invite negative energy into what we do. I do not want to complain about her. It's a silly thing to do. I don't want to do it about anybody. I think the more positive things I do and say and believe, I think my words have power, I think my thoughts have power. The more positive I do on that, the better things go in my life. Linda and I compare calendars frequently to make sure that we're together on commitments, that she's on some committees, I'm on some committees. Uh, she's got a Thursday night coming where she's going to be out. Great chance for me. I've got a rookie. It'd be a good time to hear his fist step. These kinds of things. We must compare calendars on a frequent basis. Another part of that outside issues thing is that I don't listen to women complain about their men. I have gotten into that before. And that's the first step into, uh, best case, an emotional affair, and it gets worse than that. And if a woman comes to me to complain about her man, I stop her. And I say, let me tell you something. I have a recommendation. You need to take that to him, to your sponsor, or to a, a good therapist. But you don't need to take that to me or any other man because that starts in a very bad direction. I had an experience a number of years ago. Uh, as many of you know, not all of the sharks are male. And uh, Miss Linda became concerned. That I'm a pretty huggy, touchy kind of guy. And uh, she became concerned about a woman in my home group. And she said, I'd like to ask you not to hug her anymore. And I and I don't I don't argue with that. I say okay. And I'm now shaking this woman's hand, and I'm very comfortable with it. I don't care whether she is or not, because how this woman is comfortable or not, that I'm concerned about. The rest, I love you, but but I can't let that become a priority for me. And uh, she never she I'm sure she noticed the change. She never said anything about it, and that was just fine. A couple of weeks later, she came to me with another one. And I thought, uh oh. And I said to her, I said I think you're wrong about this other one, but I'll honor your request. I think if that had gone on, then we probably got a problem above and beyond. And about two weeks later, she came back to me and she said, I was wrong about that second one. That's the last time that's come up. I think it's really, really important that we be careful with this kind of thing. 
it's uh, it's easy to step off into a really bad direction, but particularly this thing about hearing somebody else complain about their mate, it, it's bad news. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm number 10 about uh, public controversy. Oh, I love talking about this part because some fun things happen. One thing about public controversy, see, I always thought that volume was the voice of reason. That if I could just tell it a little bit louder, maybe you'd get it this time. So I know about public controversy, okay? So um, I try not, I have to listen to my own voice. Because if I'm getting uh, louder and louder, I'm getting more emotionally involved. So I have to really listen about, about my own vo voice when I'm talking. Uh, to, to Scott or to anybody that I'm in a relationship with. Um, I think the other thing about public controversy is that Scott and I started working out ways that we could communicate with each other without involving anyone else around. Uh, for example, we'd be going out to my parents' house, and uh, he'd be ready to go home. And it, it's, even though he's their favorite son-in-law that they've ever had, it would still be kind of inappropriate for him to say, hey, I'm getting bored, let's get out of here. But it's easier for me to say, hey, I didn't realize it's getting so late, we need to leave. But we worked out a signal. Remember how Carol Burnett used to pull her ear to say hello to her grandmother? Well, that's not our signal. But we have worked out signals to say, hey, I'm, I really need to get out of here. And because I honor that, I'll see the signal. And while I've been talking, Scott's been doing some of the signals that we've worked out. And you don't even know them. But if we're someplace, or if we go, if I go to Scott's meeting, uh, his home group, which means you get there for the meeting before the meeting, and then you have the meeting, and then you have the meeting after the meeting, and, and, and then you go to lunch, and then you have a meeting, and maybe you go into the movie. Well, after a while, I'm, I'm just ready to, that energy, I'm ready to just go do something else. So they say, hey, why don't we go to a movie? Well, I look like the bad wife if I say, man, I have had enough of you guys. I don't want to go to a movie. So <laughs> Scott doesn't just say, well, what do you think? And I can give him a sign, like, that's a good idea, or I don't really care, or no, I don't want to go. And and it's something that he that nobody else would notice. And they could say, no, I think we're gonna, we've got some errands we're going to run. So it's good to work out these signals ahead of time. Um, I think you can even do that with some of your sponsees. Like if you get a buzzword, you know, like, um, uh, well, one of my, one of my sponsees recently, her, her buzzword is going to be okra. And it's a good word. Um, she couldn't see how her, um, her significant other was really showing any affection. And he planted all of this, um, this garden. And I said, but he'd never seen okra before. And you're from Louisiana and he grew okra. I said, he had to, do research and learn about that. And she goes, yeah, that means he's, he's aware of me. You know, it was like a, it was like roses to her. So now every time he does anything, I says, mm, looks like okra to me. So it's okay for us to have these special words, these special languages. Um, so we, so that's, and the other thing about public controversy is that I am such an Al-Anon. I can pick out the alcoholic in a room full of people. I just I just have these little antennae that just go to that wonderful personality. In fact, when we're going to um, a conference, many times it's an AA conference, and Scott's talked to the guy on the phone, and we get at the airport, and we've never seen him, but we work out the deal. Scott says, you go pick them out, and I'll pick up the luggage, because I can pick them out in a crowd. I, I, can, I can just, I just have this great knack. And so for public controversy... Scott says that in our community of Nashville, Tennessee, that I could use this very, very good to just help promote um, recovery in our hometown. He says if you at the grocery store and you look over there and you see somebody that you're attracted to, he said you could give them one of these business cards. I said, okay. He gave me about 500 of these cards for my birthday one year. The front of it has two butterflies, very appropriate for Al-Anon, my name, phone number, that sort of thing. The back of it? It says this, hi, now this is what I'm going to hand somebody if I'm picking up the dry cleaning and I think they're, I'm attracted to them, okay? I hand them one of these cards. Hi, my name is Linda. I am a member of Al-Anon. I find you attractive. So I suggest you go have an assessment done at the nearest treatment center. 
<laughs> Scott says, just think how much, uh, how much uh, time that would save, you know. <laughs> So that's our little bit of uh, fun with public controversy, I think. <laughs> so, so number 11 says, our public relation policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, TV, and film. We need guard with special care the anonymity of all AA members. I think they put this in here so that the TV, so that we can know who, you know, you need to decide ahead of time who's going to hold the remote. I think that's that's what that means, why they put the TV in there, why that's in there. I really think that is. Um, this attraction, rather than promotion, this is one of my, my favorite stories about h how we um, we really think that we've got it all figured out. And this couple was right before they got into recovery, and so things were pretty rough at their house. But But Christmas was coming up. This is a couple from Georgia. Christmas was coming up, and... Uh, things were rough, but but she had come up with the perfect Christmas card, a uh, perfect Christmas present for her husband. She was so excited about it. She just she just knew that this was going to save their marriage, solve all their problems. So she wrapped up this gift and she put it on the Christmas tree. And a couple of days later, his present to her showed up under the tree, and she was she was shocked and amazed. It was the same size. It was the same weight. And she was so convinced that they had bought each other the same thing because she was convinced that her, her present was going to be what was going to just save all of their problems. She was so excited that they had given each other the same thing. She says, honey, on Christmas morning, we're just going to rip the paper off at the same time. He goes, okay. So Christmas morning comes, and they give the presents to each other, and they rip the paper off at the same time. And she had given him a very nice hardback copy of the Bible. He had given her the joys of sex. <laughs> so, uh, which, I lost my cheat sheet. Which, which tradition? Eleven. Number 11. So, that, so that's, you know, promotion rather than attraction, attraction versus promotion. I think that the... The main thing that I could say about my wonderful husband, Scott, is that he is a consistent AA member. He does not act one way in the meeting and then come home and kick the dog. He does not act one way and use these traditions around AA members and then put on a different game face when he comes home. And I think that is a strong sign of his recovery, that he's a consistent AA member wherever he goes. And I appreciate that so much in in our in our home, um, in our it, it, everywhere. And I really appreciate that. So. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on Tradition 11, I, I have a, a definition of manipulation that I think is kind of powerful. Manipulation is trying to get someone to do something without asking them. It's where you name the problem and jump back and hope somebody else will solve it. Try to trick them into doing it. One of the most difficult things for me in this relationship with Linda has been learning to ask for what I'd like to have. That is not easy for me. I have a long history of not getting it and that it not being safe to ask. And uh, I still have a problem with it. I've had it recently. Um, but what I've discovered is that, that no isn't that hard for me. I don't hear, hear it very often. All of my needs and virtually all of my wants are being taken care of. When you're in that situation, no isn't a big problem. And I've got a sign on my desk and the sign says, Ask Linda. And the reason I have that sign is because her al program is so good that if I want to know what she thinks about something I'm fixing to say or do, I have to ask her because I'm not a husband in training. I'm not on her caseload. She is not working me anymore. And that's just a phenomenal experience to feel like I'm complete. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll brag on her al program just a little bit more. Um, she doesn't ever help me find a parking place unless I ask her to. She treats me just like I can drive that car all by myself. It is. You drove airplanes. It is an amazing thing, really. <laughs> I drove airplanes, but it's a big sky. I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, and um, and talk about uh, anonymity in step twelve, the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions. And I'd like to read the long form of uh, tradition twelve because I think it's so powerful. It says, and finally, we have Alcoholics Anonymous believe. Well, there aren't too many pages. 
that the principle of anonymity has an immense spiritual significance. It reminds us that we are to place principles before personalities, that we are actually to practice a genuine humility, this to the end that our great blessings may never spoil us, that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. There's some powerful words in that thing. And uh, anonymity, uh, to talk about it just a little bit, anonymity means that I give my last name in AA meetings. If that doesn't make any sense to you, I'd like to recommend the book Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and the pamphlet Understanding Anonymity. That uh, Dr. Bob said failure to give your last name in an AA meeting was a break of anonymity. That we're anonymous only at the, at the public level. That we are not a secret society. The newcomer can't look up Chainsaw Mike or Wall Street Dan in the phone book. And when you go down to the, to the hospital to visit, you can't ask for Big Hat Mary. They don't have her registered, you know, so they don't know her room number. So uh, I, th I think it's important that, that we do that. And that part of anonymity is doing something for someone and not getting caught. Uh, I, think, I think Linda should probably be talking about this. She does it far, far, far better than I do. But the example she gave of, of saying, let's don't go on our vacation, that was for me. The, uh, some of the other things she's talked about are, are from a giving person. And I got here as a taker. I don't know about the rest of you drunks, but I got here as a taker. And I thought I was going to have to transition from being a taker to being a giver, and I was wrong about that. The first transition is from, from being a taker to being a receiver. The differences are that a taker can't take anything worth having. And the second thing is that a receiver admits or even acknowledges that someone else gave. They say thank you and ask for some more, and that contains humility. And having been a receiver for a while, it then becomes possible for me to be a giver. But I can't go from taker to giver. I don't have anything. It is absolutely critical to go into the, the mode of being a receiver. And I thought for the longest time that having been through that transition, that my willingness to give was what was going to keep the channel between my, me and God open. I don't believe that anymore. It's my willingness to receive because that contains humility. When I have the experience of you having a hard go and I get the chance to love on you, I get this wonderful closeness to God. I've been around a long time. When I'm hurting, when it's my turn to receive, if I don't let you know that, I block your chance to get close to God by giving. I think it's the second most selfish act there is behind suicide. Is to failure to admit that with long-term sobriety that, that my fanny's on the floor right now and I need some help. It's critically important that we do that. And uh, another piece of, of anonymity, the one I'm really talking about now, um, has to do with when I suggest, for example, that we go see a chick flick, something where they're, you know, the Guns of Navarone is playing. But, <laughs> but I say, why don't we go see Gidget does whatever. And, um, and, and go with a good attitude. Can't do it with a price tag. And go and enjoy it. And, uh, it's something I'm learning to do. And I've, I haven't learned it as well as she has. But I got the, I want to tell you about an experience that I've had, and that's, when you can do something good for somebody else and not get caught, my experience is when that happens, there's a piece of sunshine about the size of a golf ball that lodges in my chest when I do that. And and I can tell and I can think about whatever I've done anytime, no matter what's going on, and this thing will glow and send light through my whole body. And I know that people know what I'm talking about. I see you grinning at me. Okay. Yeah. And I had an experience a number of years ago. Uh, I've been a commissioned salesman for a long time. And I had one of those days that salesmen dream about where I walked in my first call at 8 o'clock in the morning. The receptionist says, oh, he's waiting for you to go right in. And I walked in. And he says, I really don't have a lot of time to work with you today. Here's your order. And, and at noon, my day was done. It had been a phenomenal day. And I'm out of business. And when I'm in, I got my fishing gear in the back. And there's a park. And I'm fishing. And there's a family. And they're having a picnic. And they got a 7-year-old boy, maybe 8. And he locked, apparently I'm going to be fishing with him today. And uh, <laughs> he locks on my leg and I'm casting and he's whining and, and um, got to talk to the family. I was at a place in my life where I had some time and uh, got to know them a little bit. And this, this little guy really had it. And he had it like I did when I was a kid. And there were no fishermen around me. And I um, arranged to take him on a couple of short trips to find out if he really had it. And he did. And uh, got permission. And when he was about nine years old, uh, he and I launched a canoe on the Buffalo River. It's about an hour west of Nashville. It's a national scenic river. It's magnificent. There, I think there, I hope there are places in heaven almost as pretty as this part of the river. 
And he and I floated five miles a river that day in about 10 hours, and we caught over 100 fish. And he caught a four-pound smallmouth bass. He got my fish. That's what happened. And uh, But about a mile from the takeout, all of a sudden the walls are straight up, and there's nowhere to get out, and the sky blackens, and we're fixing to get it. And there's nothing I can do about it. And canoeists call it eddy out. It's where you get into a little backwater, a little, and, and sort of, and I saw it parallel parked in this backwater up under some trees. And I'm about to give God a little piece of my, did you happen to notice St. Scott down here and the boy and he caught my fish? I'm about to do this prayer. And uh, and this beautiful boy looks over his shoulder at me and he says, is it okay to fish here? <laughs> and that was my second lesson that day. That was my second lesson. Because I prayed the third step prayer in a minute, the rest of my life's none of my business. And I've forgotten that. I've forgotten as recently as today. I'm not having an awful time with it. It's about, been about a month, I guess. I'm not having a bad time staying in the day. I've been, I'm, a, I'm having trouble remembering what I believe. They're in different places. My, my friend Chainsaw Mike says there's a trap door between my head and my heart. When it slams shut, I always get trapped on the wrong side. And this thing that we're about here is about keeping that trap door open. And so, so this thing about doing something nice for someone and not getting caught. See, the first time I told that story, that piece of sunshine got out. It's not in there now. It's gone. Um, I've recently been fortunate enough to add a couple. But uh, the critical piece is to not tell anybody. Because when I do something good for somebody and I don't get caught, God gets the credit and I get one of these pieces of sunshine. That's what happens. So anonymity in part, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's so important is because it contains humility. That this is about not me not getting credit for God's work. That uh, I'm, I'm not the living water, I'm the pipe. Right? On a good day, I'm a plumbing fixture. <laughs> it's, it's, my, it's my job to be an open pipe. I think, um, I think the first requirement for me to be in a healthy relationship of any kind is that I don't have to be in it. If I gotta have you for a friend, if I've gotta have her for a girlfriend, I'm not healthy enough myself. The work has to be done in here first. And when I was able to stand alone, it was from that point that I was able to find someone else who could be the other rail. But it was only when I was capable of being a rail by myself that that was gonna be possible. Um, apparently I'm gonna tell the story. Um, I, uh, I moved out of the home my first wife and I were living in when I was sober about six years. And uh, I didn't know what to do. Um, I um, I'll try to get to the beginning. She told our daughter not too long ago that when I got to recovery, I changed and she didn't. And I believe that's accurate. And I think that's a perfect analysis of what happened. And uh, I moved out because I realized one day that I was about to strike her. And I don't think I could live with myself. And I literally just walked out. And 48 hours later, I moved in a little apartment. I didn't know what to do. Um, I didn't believe in divorce. I knew if I, if I stayed with her, sometimes I think she wanted me to hit her so she'd have something else to control me with. I don't know. Uh, but I was given a gift, and the gift was three prayers, and I prayed them each morning for several years. And here they are. The first one was, God, if it's your will for us to be together, put us together. The second one, God, if it's your will for us to be apart, put us apart. Those are the easy ones. Here's the one that counts. God, if it's your will for me not to know today, leave me not knowing. That's the one. For me, that's the second half of the first step in prayer form. God's guidance to be here right on time. If it's not part of today's assignment, I can't be asking for it. I ask him to leave me not knowing if it's not his will for me to know today. When I can pray that and mean it, I can be at peace no matter what's going on. My sponsor said serenity is not freedom from the storm. Serenity is peace in the midst of the storm. That's what it is. And uh, I always thought that it was needing, it was uh, not knowing that made me crazy. And I was wrong. It was needing to know that was making me crazy. When I lay down the need to know, I can be at peace and not know. That's part of how I played God is that I needed to know. And it made me absolutely, completely crazy. Um, so if I want to work on our relation canoe, you know, what that would have meant before would have been pounding on her until she understood my way a little better. And now what I do is I work on my own spiritual program. If I want to have an A-plus relationship with anybody, i got to be prepared to work on it. i got to be prepared to change. I've got to stay in constant search for things about me that I need to change. 
I believe also this too, and this is just my stuff, I believe that a relationship can only be as healthy as the sickest person in it. And me getting out there trying to help a healthy relationship with somebody who's committed to their own sickness is just going to make me crazy. I'm referencing right now family members who are not in recovery and don't want to be. Getting out there and trying to have a healthy relationship with them will make me nuts. And their sickness will overwhelm my recovery. That's why I have to limit the time. That's why I, why I do those things. Um, I, th- I think to have a healthy relationship with anybody, it requires a bunch of C's. I've got to cheer for them. I've got to compliment them. I've got to, I've got to be compassionate. I've got to communicate. I have to tell the truth about me. And I have to commit. I have to commit time. And it can't all be talking. I missed in my notes somewhere. Part of what we do is we process our days. I listen to her day. And I ask questions about it. And I'm present when that's going on. I have a problem staying present. Uh, I grew up in a home where it wasn't safe to stay present. And I, I tend to wander off. And sometimes I have to say, excuse me, I haven't been here. Would you Would you run that portion by me again? Did you want to tell this story? No? Okay, why don't you go ahead. Okay, why don't you go ahead. See, we're not organized. We follow the traditions. No adults. <laughs> no adults. I mean, um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit was the spiritual foundation, and I love those two words together. I mean, foundation means something solid that you start building from, and and spiritual, how great. you know. And I think part of my first spiritual foundation when I came into Al-Anon was eye contact. When I first started going to meetings, I could tell you what shoes everybody wore, you know. And only afterwards, after I'd been hanging around a little while, did I start having eye contact. And I have to thank you today for the eye contact that I've been given. I really appreciate that. It it is healing, and I think it puts us on a a communicating level when we have eye contact. And And it's safe now. And those principles above personalities, I want to tell a personal story. Um, our, my daughter that's that's in recovery and her husband's in recovery and they're the ones that have the three grandsons and of our three grandsons and when the twins were two their little brother was born and Jamie was taking him in for a wellness visit at the doctor and so she has a baby in arms that she's nursing and she has two two-year-olds so she asked Nana to go with her. I said, okay, fine, I can do that. That, I, you know, they moved back to Nashville so we could all, I'll help, I'll do that. So we're at the doctor's office and you're out in that first big lobby and that's pretty fun because they've got books and games and toys and so you have to wait an hour, hour and a half. That's no biggie because we had a lot of fun. And then we're getting kind of tired and, you know, it's already past our appointment, but that's okay because now we've, they've got us back in that little tiny room, you know, the room that's about the size of this area right up here. And so now we have a tired grandmother, a tired mother, a tired baby, and two tired two-year-olds, and um, and we're in this little bitty room. And quite honestly, I did not know that there was that much white paper on one of those rolls. I mean, I did not know that. <laughs> those guys got very busy in there, and they're just like, whoo, whoo, whoo. And so, you know, the, the doctor finally comes in, and she's a great... Um, pediatrician and she knows our family history and, and so here we are, you know, ragged and the, and, you know, there's cotton balls and Q-tips and, you know, everything's everywhere. And I said, you know, I am, I'm sorry about this room and the condition of it, but I said, you know, we, I swear we've got this little alcoholic running around because he would be opening the doors and throwing things out and the other one would be coming around and pushing them out. He's trying to talk their, their way out of not getting in trouble. And I said, we've got this little AA and this little al running around in here. And the doctor said, I love to tell this story about principles above personalities. This doctor says, no, no, no. She, she says, um, don't, don't label these little two-year-olds as alcoholics and, and al She said, don't, don't put any labels on them. That, that's not a good practice. So I think that's okay. And she kind of paused and she says, besides, it's not that Two-year-olds act like alcoholics. It's that alcoholics act like two-year-olds. <laughs> and I, I do love to tell I, I that do, story. I do, I do. Because that, that, was, a, that was a medical opinion, you know. <laughs> oh, and we are living happily ever after. Not without, not without hiccups and bumps and, and growth, you know. I just, I just, I don't like the growth periods, but 
but that, that that's but that's why we're here. I believe that God has a commitment to this relationship, that he is free to leave it. Therefore, I know the fact that he's in it means that he's in it by choice. And the same thing is true. I'm here. I show up in this married marriage every day because I choose to. Yeah. Hope to see you tomorrow. I'm through with my part. Thanks. Okay. I, I think it's important that we can't make each other happy. Mm-hmm. And, and this is my stuff again. Um, I've had happiness and pleasure confused for a long time. I'm going to play with you a little bit. I hope you'll play with me. Who, when you were a child, wanted a bicycle? You were certain if you could get a bicycle, you'd be happy, and you get a bike. Let's see him. Great. Are you happy? No? Let's try another one. Who wanted him or her? Sure, if you could get him, you'd be happy, and you got him. Let's see it. Okay, now you could be sitting next to him. I'm going to give you a break, not ask the other question. <laughs> but I think I made my point. And, and my problem is that I had pleasure and happiness confused. Pleasure is on the physical plane. It is of a limited duration, and there's something out there that will bring it. Happiness is an inter- inside job. It's on the spiritual plane, and it's a direct result of having a healthy relationship with God and the rest of you. And that's what, in, at least in part, what the 12 steps are about. So I do not expect Linda to make me happy. I do not take responsibility for making her happy. What we do is we share the happiness. And I have to go and get my own. I enjoy being with her. She brings me pleasure. But I think it's a very, very, for me, it's a very important distinction. A lot of what we worked out and some of what you've heard tonight came from something Linda came up with a little over 10 years ago. And we call it a one-couple retreat. We did the first and we were married, I guess, about a year. And um, we planned it for months. And I've got a handout on this. It's on the other side of that St. Francis Prayer uh, conflict resolution I talked about. I think I've got enough to go around. If I don't, we'll run some more copies. But um, the purpose is to enhance a good relationship, not to fix a broken one, and uh, to store up truths and to more fully uh, enjoy the fruits of a coupleship. That's what it's about. And say so we planned it for months. We planned menus. Uh, we left on a Thursday afternoon to come home on a Sunday afternoon. We planned topics. Now, this is not a vacation. Um, it's a retreat. It's a working retreat. We came up over the course of the months of the topics we were going to talk about. Retirement, uh, spending limits was one of them. Family, we're going to talk about all the family members. We're going to talk about play, hobbies, toys. That would be things like boats, airplanes. Uh, where do you want to live? What can I expect from you if I develop a long-term illness? A lot of things, and I'm not going to read them all. I've got a whole bunch more. And then we assigned them values. This one could be pretty tough. We don't want to put two tough ones next to each other. We'll put a light-duty one next to a heavy-duty one. We planned a schedule. We assigned chair people. Right? There's just two of us there. The chair person is responsible for starting and stopping on time, for uh, keeping us on topic, and for making notes because we got to plan 120 days out to review the notes to see if we've made the changes that we've committed to. What did we actually accomplish here? I said we planned the menus. From that, we backed into a grocery list. And when we left on Thursday afternoon, there's a place not far from Nashville where we were able to rent a cabin for a weekend where we wouldn't have to have contact with anybody else on the planet. There's a phone there. And we notified everyone we sponsor and all the family members that uh, the one daughter has the phone number there. If you have an emergency, get a hold of her. You can call us. Allow us to define emergency for you. An emergency is when there's blood on the floor and you have called 911. If you don't have both of those, don't call. And we dropped off the planet for a weekend. It was probably the most amazing experience of my life. I have never felt that close to another human being in my life. We talked about our own deaths. I talked about what it would feel like me to get the notification that she had just died. And it touched the depth of my soul that had never been touched before. It has not been touched since. And she held me while I just sobbed. Um, Say it was a phenomenal experience. We did it again about five years. Oh, out of that came a series of understandings. You've heard some of them, things like spending limits, like we can ask these two questions. It's a front. That one's a front and back, and it's edited, of uh, the things that we came up with, just as some ideas. And if that that has any calling to you, you're welcome to take one of these. About five years later, we did another one that uh, within the course of an hour and a half turned into a vacation because we just buffed up everything. I mean, we we had nothing left. We had it in place. It was in good shape. Um, I got fired from a fabulous job in March of last year. What happened was that 
it was the uh, another company, big company bought our little company, and uh, they had somebody in my territory. And my job evaporated. And uh, we went and did another one primarily on finances, and uh, and we're still pretty much unemployed. I do some part-time stuff. But um, we've had to stay very, very close on that. And that's I, I've been out of the frame a couple of times since then, and I, I think more than I've, I'm aware of. These are the kinds of things that we've done to try to hold ourselves together, to try to operate from principle rather than from motive, which is one of the most important lessons I guess I ever got, is that motive is not the deal. I hear it in the meetings, but the literature doesn't tell me that. The literature tells me, actually, if I could, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this. Have you got something else, on? You're through. This is page 60 in the text. And it's referring to self-will. It says, on that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Collision. Think about that word. That's different from like mild disagreement. Collision, right? Even though our motives are good. And the, the day I got that lesson, um, I had a customer who was a, he was a purchasing agent at a major account. Y'all might know the name of it if I said it. And he represented a third of my income. He could have bought two or three times that much from me if I could have sold him everything I wanted to. We were personal friends. Our wives were friends. We're guests in each other's homes. We had spiritual discussions. It was an amazing individual. His wife delivered a child a couple of months early, and the news was not good. And he called me and he said, Will you come down to this hospital and pray over this child? And I said, yeah. And I got in my car and I drove down to the hospital and I pulled into the parking place, and I did what I've been hearing in meetings, checking my motives, and I can't answer the question. I don't know whether I'm going down there to pray over that child to bring spiritual relief to that family or if I'm going down there to pray over that child to get closer to that guy so that he'd put some more cash in my pocket. I can't answer the question. And this is what I believe. I believe when I need an answer and can't get one, I have either asked the wrong question and the right question on the wrong day is still the wrong question or it's okay if I make a mistake here because there's a lesson that accompanies it that I need to learn and this is going to be the best way for me or someone else to learn the lesson. It's one of the two. But I did what you taught me. And I prayed. And I said, God, I, I, I don't know what to do here. I, they tell me to check my motives. I can't answer the question. Could I please have some help? Something like that. I'm not going to ask you to believe that what came to me next was from him. I believe it myself. And what I got next was a question. And the question was, does going into a hospital to pray over a sick child violate any of your principles? And the answer was no. This is not about motive. There are no wrong reasons for doing the right thing, just like there are no right reasons for doing the wrong thing. And the other example I give with the men I sponsor when we do that portion of step three, as I say, here's an example for you. I can see clearly that you need a particular lesson. And I'm about to make up a story out of my past and tell it to you for true that never happened so that you can get a lesson, which is a good motive. What's wrong here? It's a lie. All right, it's outside of principle. So when we talk about turn it over to God, how do we do that? And the answer is we use his means. I don't get Satan's end. I don't get God's end using Satan's means. I'm responsible for means, not ends. Second half of the first step says I'm not in management. That means I'm not responsible for how it turns out. I'm blue collar. I'm responsible for what I do. And it continues to come down to that. And it comes down to what I do in every relationship. My priorities are not what I say they are. My priorities what I do. I've got one more sign on my desk, and I'm going to close with this. And it says, remember, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.